Hello and welcome to another episode of the DJ Project Criterion Collection. Today we're going to talk about Spine 235, The Leopard, directed by Luciano Visconti, 1963. This film is another uh, one that gets the adjective epic and it's actually rightfully deserved. Um, we're talking grand cinematography, this was shot in Super Technorama, even though it wasn't shown in the United States in, in that format. It was, it was kind of shown in a somewhat cheap, somewhat degraded way, and also shorter, too. Um, a lavish production design, and it's, uh, the setting is, is, in a, is during a, a very key moment in in Italian history, and that's the uh, Risorgimento, uh, where Italy became Italy, uh, moving away from just a mere collection of aristocratic states that shared a peninsula into a unified democratic nation. So it it has all of those elements, but interestingly enough, what what I when I think about the film is how in spite of the grandeur that it, it can convey, it also is very subtle. There's there's a lot of subtlety. It doesn't it doesn't feel like it's this big throbbing um, you know explosion of energy. Even though there is an action sequence in this, there is there is a bat there is a battle that that um, occurs in the story. But even then, it's it's still, um, it doesn't feel like it's 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 over the top, you know. In spite of its, um, in spite of its look and and what went into the mise en scene and so forth. Um, the film is based on a novel written by uh, uh, Giuseppe Tomisi de Lampedusa, um, and it's set in Sicily. Uh, during the uh, Regis, uh, Regis Ormento. And the key characters in this story uh, are the, is the Prince of Selina, uh, Don Fabrizio Cobara, played by Burt Lancaster, uh, his nephew, um, Ten and Tancredi uh, Falconeri, played by Alain, Alain Delon, uh, who while having the aristocratic upbringing, he also sees uh, this as an opportunity to make some revolutionary changes. He, he joins with uh, Garibaldi's red shirts and helps to, uh, helps to bring about that change. And an interesting way Don Fabrizio does it too, but in his own particular way. Um, and then finally, um, the woman who would become uh, Tenegrecki's uh, fiance, Angelica Sidera, played by Claudia Cardinal. And so really that's kind of what the, the, the film, and there's other characters too, and there's, and there's other things that, that go on, but basically if you're to dis really distill it in a nutshell, it's, it's, it's about that transition. It's the, it's the waning of the aristocracy and the emergence of the new Italy, uh, led by led by a very ambitious um, and very driven middle class, and it's it's about how all of these things kind of come about. And I think one of the one of the interesting takeaways from this film is that while it is that revolutions are not are often not these big bang things <laughs> where, you know, it's, it's, it's all of a sudden like there's this big thing with some exceptions. I mean, the, I mean, I would consider the French revolution to be uh, naturally dramatic, but more often than not, I think revolutions or any kind of changes or transitions are not, not this big explosion so much, but rather it's, it's, it's more subtle. And actually what happens, what, how a transition or a change happens is basically a sequence of little choices 
that are made on a human scale that will orient you from what that will take you from one direction into another and the leopard does that shows that in a very in a very real and genuine way um, and that is it's a combination of well actually what it's it's in large part due to the, due to the direction and this gets into a little bit of Luciano Visconti himself Visconti is when you look at his life and what he what he's done and, and what he's and certainly what he's made in, in terms of films he's um, an array of interesting paradoxes on the one hand you have a guy who was uh, born who was himself born into an aristocratic family and interestingly I think this is the reason why uh, the leopard I think Visconti was the only guy that could that could do that story justice is because he was he was familiar with <clears throat> the aristocratic life and and knew what it what it what it entailed um, you know having you know growing up being fascinated with the arts having the chance to meet uh, Buccini and Toscanini and um, in addition to working with film, he also works. He also worked as an opera and theater director, and was known for his lavish. You know, everything to him was lavish. He was. He was not. He was not one for uh, frugal frugality <laughs> and, and modesty. You know, everything was. Everything was. Everything was fine to him. He had. He had very refined tastes. Um, he had exquisite manners um, and a lot of grace and control and so on so that's the one side and then the other side is during World War II he joined the Italian Communist Party um, he was uh, he was a he was homosexual um, he was one of the key figures of the Italian neorealist movement along with Rossellini and De Sica and maybe one or two others that I'm forgetting offhand, but he was he was he was actually in that and actually that's how he got his start in filmmaking. Um, uh, his first film was Rocco and his brothers. I believe that was his first film, or maybe the, there may have been one other before that. But I, I know that was that was early, and and interestingly, like Rossellini and De Sica, um, that was more of a just a, a start for him, and he would later do more lavish films and the leopard would be the beginning of this the other film that he would be best known for would be death in venice and so it's that's what makes visconti kind of interesting you know on the on the one hand he's um of an older time but also at the same at the same time he was also very modern and in in some respects so um it, it's it's those kinds of paradoxes and such but the leopard I, I think definitely makes it very clear that that he was that he's um, about his upbringing and and uh, his his temperament and so forth one thing about Visconti that I I think I've noticed in, in various anecdotes and stories about him is that um, by having that by having that upgrading which where there's there's a there's a, a strong where you're you're trained very heavily to do things with tact and grace. Um, it, it's not you know it's it's not proper to have strong emotional outbursts. There's there's a there's a bit of a of a, a grace and decorum to it. So in a lot of times there's you know he comes off as he came off as very very graceful and um, and very well composed, but but every now and then there would be these little outbursts <laughs> that come in where the where the the curtain is pulled aside or the mask comes off and, and then suddenly you, you get this little you get this little burst. And I think that's what makes Visconti kind of interesting is is that this this combination of, of having a, a certain grace and and an elegance an, an exterior elegance, but at the same time there's all these 
emotions and everything kind of raging inside. I think it's really, really interesting because I think what I... I get less and less interested with things that appear very over the top. Um, I like... I, I appreciate a lot more subtlety in performances. And I think that that really comes through because, because again, it's while there's a lot of things about the film that feel very grand and feel very expensive, it's not, you don't, it doesn't feel like there's this big, this, this overwhelming, overflowing, throbbing thing. It's, it's done in a very sort of subtle, or lack of a better word, subdued way. Um, and, and in that sense, it, it, feels a, it feels a bit more real, a bit more genuine. And in a certain sense, I think that's an interesting sort of carryover with, uh, from neorealism. If, if allegedly one of the ideas of neorealism is, is to bring something a little bit more natural and, and more realistic in your, in your cinema, then in a certain sense, he continues on with that. He just, he just now has a very nice uh, proscenium to go with it. And probably the best example, now admittedly, it's been a couple months since I last saw um, The Leopard in Full. And for the purposes of this review, there's one scene I really wanted to revisit because I, I think this scene, this particular scene or sequence is arguably the crown jewel of the film. And that is towards the end. And it's the ballroom sequence. The film itself lasts for 185 minutes. This ballroom sequence doesn't start until about 2 hours 17. And then it goes all the way almost to the end. There's one more scene that happens at the end. Uh, but it showcases a transition. But... Um, so a fairly hefty chunk of the film is devoted to this, to this ball that happens um, in Don Fabrizio's uh, summer palace. I guess you could call it that. Um, and it's a it's a it's a stunning sequence, uh, especially in terms of of cinematography and production design. You know, the costumes are. Are lovely. The colors are great, and you know there's this because of everything is moving, and the interiors are all lavish. It's just it's just this it's just a splendid movement of color, and this is this is uh, what makes part of what makes cinema so fascinating is is is, is having these sequences of of having these rapid succession of images um, that gives you a, a sense of motion and color and so forth. It's, it, it's a very dynamic art form. And so this is definitely a great example of that. Um, it's a sequence where, where on the one hand, it's, it's a fairly straightforward uh, depiction of a, of a ball, of some of the things that go on. You know, people dance, people eat, people... People giggle amongst them. <laughs> women giggle amongst themselves. Um, women are constantly fanning themselves because because uh, in actually in, in the in the production they they managed to make the film during the hottest <laughs> hottest point of the year. So everybody was trying to keep cool and 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 being that this is a very formal occasion, just it's very easy to sweat with very with very lavish dresses and, and, uh, and, uh, tuxedos and so forth. So, so on the one hand, there's, there's, you know, it, it plays pretty, pretty normal, but at the same time, this is also a moment where a lot of things do happen. Um, it's, it's very clear that there is going to be this change that, um, Tancredi and, and Angelica, in a certain sense, they represent the future, both good and bad. Um, and then also for Don Fabrizio, he realizes this is the end for him in a lot of respects. Um, certainly this is going to be the end of 
the old order, but it's also going to be his personal end as well. And so, so, there are that, so there's a lot of dramatic things that happen, but again, it's played in a very subtle and realistic manner. You, you don't, there's not a lot of, well, there, again, there's, there's, there's those occasional outbursts, but it always, but even then it seems to reel back into something a little bit more, you know, a little bit more subdued. That's more on the aristocratic side. Now on the, <laughs> for the, for the revolutionary side, it's, it's pretty much hearts on your sleeves. And I think that's another thing that makes it very interesting. This transition is, is you see the contrast between the two sides. Uh, and particularly with um, Angelica, in fact, when she's first introduced, you know, long before this sequence, uh, it becomes clear that she was not was not familiar with with how you conduct yourself socially, and comes off as as a little bit um, ungracious. And her father also comes off as a bit of a buffoon. He's the uh, he's the mayor of Donna Fugata and, and one of the one of the men who who also brings about this change, uh, this this transition, and done in his own particular way. So, so yeah, that comes through. So, why do I why do I mention why do I highlight this this ballroom scene? And it's it really is quite fascinating to watch just just to to see the 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 details and the richness of it. It's just it's it's quite exquisite. Um, the reason why I, I, I really wanted to point this out is because this is a scene that would influence another sequence. That would be Connie's wedding in The Godfather. Um, and then also this is a sequence that would influence a director, namely Michael Cimino. This is pretty much the reason why he felt justified in making a 40-minute sequence of celebrating a wedding in The Deer Hunter and why he would do it twice over again with Heaven's Gate. The prologue, the, um, the waltzing during uh, the graduation at Harvard graduation, uh, day, graduation day at Harvard, the, the waltz out in the courtyard, um, which again looks nothing like Harvard, but that's a whole other story. And then the other dancing moment um, Actually, there's a couple more in in the actual building that's called Heaven's Gate, and one of them, one of the most famous examples uh, is waltzing using roller skates. <clears throat> so, anyway, so yes, this sequence um, I believe made a, a big impression on Chimino and something that gets carried over in, in um, his subsequent films, and particularly those two films. So, um, but yeah, it's. Um, I guess other things to note. I mean, it, it was uh, one of the things it it shows is is how Burt Lancaster is is kind of a little bit underrated as an actor. I mean, this is a guy that uh, was you know was known for like Sweet Smell of Success and was usually you know perceived as as kind of a, as a gangster type. But here he plays this this aging aristocrat in the nineteenth century. And he was able to do it because, uh, actually, a lot of why he was able to do it is because he basically just looked at the way Visconti moved and just emulated him. And that's a, that's a lot of how he was able to, uh, to make that performance. And even though for the, for the Italian version, the 185-minute version, um, his voice was dubbed over. In fact, everybody's voices were, were dubbed over. I mean, even even Claudia Carnell's voice was dubbed over, and I think I think also part of it was because of her origins, and the voice would betray her origins or something like that. But anyway, um, but he still you still feel like it's it, it, even though it, it's it's not his voice, you still feel like it's him, and and it's it's this is a case where it's not just it's not just dialogue it's it's all it's all in the action and and the action definitely speaks a lot to the character and as well as help tell the story and and so it's it's a really 
it, it's a, it's another great example of <laughs> of seeing that at play, um, and but yeah, it's 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 lavish, it's gorgeous, it's um, it's it certainly lives up to the epic of um, the epic description, but remarkably, I think it's very very subtle um, in in terms of performance. The other characteristic of Visconti, and this comes through especially in starting from the leopard onwards, is uh, he's attributed to deliberate pacing, where a story is just unfolds more naturally. And 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 like I said earlier, there's not this big over the top thing. It's 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 almost sort of downplayed. I think that's also something that Cimino picked up. And try to use in, in his films. I think Visconti pulls it off better than Cimino. And I think a lot of it, and I would attribute a lot of it to um, the fact that Visconti was was a theater and opera director himself. And you, you have to be, when you do that, you have to be sensitive to how emotions play out over time. And knowing when to go big and when not to go big and how to maintain interest, even if you downplay the emotions, even if you if you go for more subtlety, how do you still um, take the audience along for the ride? And I think he I think he had that sensitivity. So that, um, and I think that that is because he was he worked he's worked with opera and 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 with theater, whereas Chimino. His background was more in painting, so he's going to fixate more on the visuals, more than anything. And um, so, for him, it's 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 definitely going to look good. And when he's not in the way of things, he can let things play out, and it and it feels more genuine. But other than that, it doesn't <clears throat> doesn't really quite work. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of Cimino, and there's also for other reasons. But at any rate, so. Um, I would say that if you if you like your films lavish, if you like um, if if you like a certain grandeur, I think you'll definitely like it. But at the same time, it also is interesting to see something a little bit more subtle. Um, in fact, you could call this an epic character <laughs> piece, um, since it it really does uh, look at this at this. This Prince of Selena, because because the thing that that happens to him is you you see the kind of life he has lived. You see, you see um, and it's it's alluded. To, there are certain scenes that showcase this, and there are things and conversations that point to a past he's had, and and he's had, um, you know, a, a fair for all intents and purposes a very rich life, uh, pun slightly intended, but. He also ends up being a part of this this change that happens um, in 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 Sicily, and, and and of course this change affects the whole of what will become Italy. And in a way, he recognizes well. He recognizes this change, and he does. On the one hand, he does what he can to make it easier or to have you know, some say in it, but at, but at the same time, he's also, he's also powerless, and actually the change ends up, in so many ways, leading him closer to his death, um, and so on the one hand, he's in control, but he's also not in control, um, he is, on the one hand, he was, he was destined, he was, he had the fate of of being the Prince of Selena, but at the same time, he is also destined to have that position made irrelevant due to the due to the political change. In that sense, it's very interesting to look at. And again, I think Visconti was was the right director to make this happen because he he himself was part of those two worlds. He was a he was brought up more or less an aristocrat, even though he never 
really, ex you know, even though he never really exercised any titles, he certainly had that background and that access. But he was also very modern and could, you know, champion certain modern causes and, and, and ideas. And I think he can understand the, and he understands that there, that there are pluses and minuses to both. Um, and, and, you know, even, even the, 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 even the so-called Risorgimento, wait, no, I'm sorry, even in the Risorgimento, it can give off the appearance of something great and wonderful and ushering a new thing. It also can anticipate some other things that would probably not be pleasant down the road. So it's, it's not just, um, there's, um, on the one hand, a, a kind of, the, the, well, sorry, there's a kind of ambivalence <laughs> to it. I mean, it's, I think it's, in the end, it's, it feels welcomed, but at the same time, there's some, uh, there's some slight hesitancies, there's some slight uh, concerns that, that can arise. And, and I think that's what makes it really, really interesting. So, so yeah, if you like your historical, if you like your epic historical films, and even in epic historical films that do things that you don't normally see in, in those kinds of films, definitely check it out. And um, so, yeah, The Leopard. And until next time, take care.